Folks, you're with Tacitus today at your pushback channel, and thank you for joining this radio live stream. In this essay, I'd like to talk about um, who could be considered as, as one of the greatest, if not the greatest, military general uh, of all time. Now, there are you know, quite a few contenders, the obvious ones, Napoleon Bonaparte and Julius Caesar and so on. Um, but the you know, must the criteria determine to determine the uh, the greatness of, of a, a general or military leader or, or in the case of Napoleon really a generalissima um, is how many battles they won and Napoleon is, is credited with having won the most battles and thus is the the most um, uh, is, is appears on on most people's lists at least as, as the greatest general of all time and and his generalship is is not not for debate he was clearly a, one of the great military commanders of all time there's no question of that um a, a lot of the time napoleon was 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 um was fighting in my view fighting uh, um you know troops of an inferior quality and also you know inferior leadership but but the leadership we can sort of put aside for, for the moment um because if napoleon won uh, due to leadership then again he was clearly the better general but but um most of the time he was uh, in my view fighting troops that were um uh, not as well supplied not as well equipped not as well trained that sort of thing now you can say well that that means napoleon was good at, at organizing you know battle logistics and organizational development and that in turn is is surely the the wider part of generalship if, if not the generalship of the battlefield certainly the you know the the, uh, the back room if you will of, of getting it all together and napoleon was quite quite involved in all that um, and all the munitions and if you look at the the uh, if he, the equivalent of the office memos he was sending out to his quartermasters and and the various um, logistics officers and that sort of thing he was he was really uh, um, going to a certain level of detail to make sure there's going to be enough rifles enough bullets enough gunpowder enough cannons enough horses and so on and so forth so he was he was certainly into uh, into that and that all that all plays a plays a part even so. Um, the, uh, for the most part, in my view, at least, the um, the uh, you know the enemy he was facing um, just wasn't as good quality anyway. They just just weren't you know the the fighting spirit you know all the whole the whole thing just wasn't wasn't as good. Uh, and this this was very much part of of um, I believe part of uh, a big part of Napoleon's victories. Now that, that's not to take anything away from Napoleon. Again, he was a great general, um, and um, and he he did things that caught everyone by surprise. You know, forced marches, so he'd appear two days before the other side had got their shit together, and and um, and so on. And he was you know, expert at picking battlegrounds and. Uh, uh, and so on, and, and a number of his battles, by the way, were close-run things. So um, he wasn't always winning by a huge margin. And even if we look at Waterloo, um, uh, where uh, he he wanted to divide the British, uh, the British and the Dutch uh, and, uh, armies, he wanted to divide them from the Prussians. Now he sent off um, one of his generals with a, a corps, and they were to sort of um, interdict. The Prussian line of march to come to Waterloo to help help the British, and the the French general um, tasked with that dragged his feet quite a bit, I think, and and didn't manage to to get in between where the Prussians were and where the the British were, were locked in a life and death struggle with Napoleon's main army. So as a result, the, the Prussians were able to arrive in the I think it was the late late morning or early afternoon. The Prussians were able to arrive, which, which decisively tipped the balance. Now, had the Prussians not arrived, had that core, which Napoleon had thought this through, by the way, he, even at the time in 1815, there was a lot of people saying his powers were fading. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure if they were fading, then um, they kind of faded by too much uh, because uh, they came within a whisker of winning at Waterloo. It was a very close run thing. Now, let's suppose the Prussians hadn't arrived. Um, the the uh, I believe the the polling would have won and 
defeated Wellington at Waterloo. He would have taken very heavy casualties in the process, but but he would have won. Um, whether or not he'd have been in condition then to fight the subsequent battles because the there was an Austrian army and a Russian army, sort of an, uh, more Prussian forces heading his way. Whether he could have defeated all of them, it, it, that's rather unlikely. So I think he would have, if not, if he didn't, you know, maybe he would prevail in the following battle, but then he'd have been screwed thereafter, is my view. Just didn't have the resources to fight that that many people in the time that he had. Now, from the time he got back to France, because he was in, in exile in um, Elba, from the time he got back to, to France, he had just three months to organise the army and the armed force, you know, the munitions, all the sort of stuff. He was able to do that in three months and, and still came within a whisker of, of winning. But... <coughs> But the Prussians did arrive in time, um, while the other the French corps that was, <coughs> excuse me, supposed to be chasing them was was off somewhere, still, still probably um, you know six to eight hours march away, and so the Prussians intervened. Napoleon had to divert troops to to look after them and take care of them, and then with moving those troops away from the the front line, he he didn't have enough to to finally overwhelm the British after what had been a very intense struggle for most of the day so um so it was a, again a close run thing so i think napoleon would have if if the general sent to in, interdict the, the prussian line of march had, had done as he was ordered and got on with it then uh, waterloo would have turned out differently um but um but there you go that's that's history for that's the historical role of the dice but but i believe that the great the, the greatness of generalship is is not only winning battles, which of course the general must do, but it's it's against the quality of the opposition. Now, the greatest military power, bar none, in in the Mediterranean basin, in in um, uh, in what was it two two twenty BC, um, was Rome, and you know they were the best trained armies, the best equipped armies. They had a standing army that they could call on. They had troops all over the place. Um, these guys weren't loose, used to losing. They they were beating some some pretty pretty serious opposition. Um, uh, sometimes uh, you know the, the, these wild tribes um, were, were relatively numerous that the Romans were fighting, but they weren't disciplined or well equipped necessarily. So um, when Hannibal showed up, um, the Carthaginian general, that's like modern day Libya, that sort of thing. He um, he was able to defeat the Romans again and again and again. Well, not only defeating the the, the foremost military and engineering power in the in the world, I, I believe at the time, but um, he was able to defeat them. I mean, not just beat them, thrash them, and, and do so while being numerically inferior. Now he did did this through you know, various things: use of ambush, use of surprise, um, through through the most um, you know, far-thinking, far-sighted tactics and organisational control, um, uh, and and a whole range of things uh, that the, you know the troops had absolute faith in his judgment, that, that sort of stuff, um, which isn't easy for a general to achieve, um, particularly uh, Hannibal because he had um, you know Numidians and Libyans and Gauls and you know a whole range of people, and none, none of whom you know had the same language. Yet Hannibal was able to. Not only control them and direct them and get them to follow follow his orders, but he's able to to um, to arrange you know, superb organisation on the battlefield and um, and uh, again you know to be able to win victory after victory. Now, now the final battle at, at, at Zama in um, what was it 201 202 BC, um, Hannibal would have won that if if the Romans hadn't bribed his Numidian, Numidian allies and their cavalry to defect. Um, if the Numidians had stayed with the Carthaginians, Hannibal would have won again, and uh, the Romans would have, uh, you know, had a tough, tough time um, subduing uh, Carthage with Hannibal there in command of a, a sizable uh, army that he was leading. So, so Hannibal was, um, I believe, is possibly the greatest general of all time. Not necessarily the number of battles he won, and he won plenty of those. But because he was up against some real quality opposition. Now, on the, the flip side, some people have said, well, the, the, because he was killing so many Roman soldiers, some of the Roman soldiers coming along afterwards, some of the later battles, um, weren't very well trained um, and they were hastily recruited and sort of thrown into battle. 
Um, I don't buy that. There were still plenty of hardened, experienced, um, particularly the heavy infantry legions that that had survived the previous encounters that could form the core of any form the core of any um, any subsequent armies. Now, what the Romans did have is they had massive resources far in excess of what the Carthaginians did, and they prepared to dedicate them to the the wider strategic effort. And so they were able to, to really wage war all across the Mediterranean basin, whereas the Carthaginians didn't have those sort of resources and the Carthaginian Senate was was more reluctant to commit um, the sort of resources were necessary for, for victory. Equally, the, the Romans would, um, not always, but they would put a lot of their commanders would be based on merit. Uh, patricians for sure, but, but, but merit. Um, the Carthaginians were a little bit more inclined to put well-connected folks in in the um, positions of you know, being uh, admirals in the Navy and generals on the ground in the other theatres outside of where Hannibal was operating. So really Hannibal was just the one military genius they had and there was really no one. The rest of them were, were fairly ordinary um, and and didn't uh, couldn't cut it against the Romans. But, but Hannibal, I would argue, um, defeated... Uh, the most formidable, by, by far, the most formidable military power in the Mediterranean. And uh, he did that uh, repeatedly, again, with inferior numbers and without having a national army. You know, the Romans, it was, it was all Roman citizens or Italian citizens. With with um, with Hannibal, as I say, he had, you know, three, four, five different nationalities in, in his army, but he's still able to to get that commitment and that zeal for victory that um, that is rare at any time. But Hannibal was able to... To put it into the so I would argue Hannibal is is the greatest general, but I, I'd like to see your comments below. Now we can look at other candidates, and there are plenty of other candidates, by the way. Um, you know Julius Caesar, for example. But Julius Caesar's victories weren't against first class opponents. Um, so, um, or for the most part, you know the, I mean, there are a couple of exceptions, but but they were. Um, now, you, you know, people argue, well, he only had an army of 40,000, but he defeated an army of 250,000 Gauls. Um, that, that's, that's so, um, and, and that is, by the way, a huge achievement. Um, but even, you know, the Gauls were still ill-equipped and ill-disciplined and were, were um, never able to organise to charge the Roman line at the same time. And if they had, they would have won. It's just piss poor discipline from the Gauls. Um, and and iron discipline from the Romans, by the way, but but um, so Julius Caesar, a great general, sure, um, but but didn't didn't have to overcome the most formidable military power of the day. Now you can go on with looking at other other generals that, um, and and it's easy. Yeah, Alexander the Great is a case point again, a great general, no question of it. Um, but uh, he was fighting battles of a decaying empire where. Most of the soldiers were keener to run from the battlefield than to stay and fight on it. It's not hard to beat people that panic and run away as soon as you you wave a few, uh, you, know, you know, shout at them and, and wave a sword in their face. So, so Alexander's victories um, were not the sort of hard won victories against a really formidable, you know, well disciplined, well equipped opponent. Um, that, uh, that Hannibal had to achieve. So again, I look, look forward to your comments below and uh, you've been with Tacitus today and thank you for listening.